How you doing now? Anybody can make it louder? What happened to Sonia? She's on strike. All right. Hello. <laughs> can someone make it louder? Hello. Make it louder. <clears throat> make it louder, brother. Okay. That's good. Yeah. And he was the toy was good, yeah. <laughs> okay, the first toy I'm learning is okay folks, we have just a few minutes. Ike Shoresh Asimcha Hu Belev Prinas Nasat Asimcha Belevi You know, this is one of the very deep terms of Nachman. This is Rav Nosen, Rav Nachman. Because a person has to know exactly from the headquarters, right? If I'm hungry, I feel it in my kishkes, right? If you have a headache, you feel it in your head. Your feet hurt you, your feet. What, what's the headquarters for the heart? I mean, for joy. Where does it begin? And you know what it is? Um, imagine if I get something, and I don't know if I should put it in my bedroom or in the fridge there. So I have to know where it belongs. So Ram Nachman says, Simcha belongs into the heart. Meaning to say, Simcha, you're not happy because you understand that you should be happy. Because if you wait until you understand you should be happy, you have also 10,000 understandings that you shouldn't be happy, right? Simcha is in the heart. So, the Torah is a long Torah, but a person who is not the Simcha, what am I supposed to do? Not think strong, I should be the Simcha because it won't help. Mama, you have to cleanse your heart. Mama, you have to cleanse your heart. And this is also not so simple. God forbid, if my heart is full of sadness, how do I get it out? So here's the other Torah of Rav Nachman. Rav Nachman says that Simcha is not a luxury, but Simcha joy is the natural state of the heart. The natural state of the heart is the Simcha. Right? Children, when they're born, they're much the Simcha until they make them sad, right? Let's say when you wake up in the morning on a normal day, before you start thinking about everything, this one was did you wrong, this one might do you wrong, this one definitely will do you wrong, this one could you wrong. Please, when you wake up in the morning, you have a simcha. So you see, if I would have to change my heart to be the simcha, it would be very hard. But what I have to do is just take away all the garbage which is in my heart. So he says, as much as much simcha is in my heart, but but if you don't talk about it, if you're not talking with simcha, it won't last. This is so strong, you know, like so many things. You know, a person's person talks bitter and angry, then ask them, are you with simcha? Are you full of joy? He says, yeah, I'm full of joy. But even the way he says it is bitter. I want you to know something very strong. The head goes to here. And from here begins the heart. And basically, my words, they filter maybe through my head, but 
it's my heart. And you see, if a person doesn't talk with heart, that means there's something sick, because every word has to come from my heart. And today, all the politicians, all the people who talk without heart, means there's a terrible blockage between their heart and their mouth. I want you to know something awesome. You know, for all the big rebels, it was not permissible to have a tie when you daven, because that means you cut your mouth from your heart, right? Make a little. And the officer would say, all the big liars wear ties. I mean, have you ever seen the politicians? I mean, they put so much energy into their ties, right? You know, like in the big synagogues of the rabbis, you couldn't come in with a tie. You had to take it off. I have to tell you a good story. Ha, ha, ha. You know, Rab Kornim is Kalman, everybody knows the story about Rab Kornim is Kalman, the Heilige Pierre Setzner. For him it was absolutely forbidden, uh, forbidden to walk in with a tie. So one of his students, when he had graduated, and he went off a little bit from Yiddishkeit, he was wearing a tie. Same was told at night with thousands, thousands of people. Rav Kornim is Kalman. Remember, I told you once, Rav Kornim is Kalman is one of the rabbis. Same was told at night. The only person who danced was the rabbi in Koshnitz. Everybody stands in circles, and the rabbi stands in the middle and dances. But Kival, the rabbi takes you and he dances. Kival, right? So you'll never reach there. It's awesome, right? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so he walked in with a tie and he said, said Thousands of people, the rabbi's not going to notice. He's standing by the door. Suddenly the rabbi turned around and walked straight up to him. <coughs> you know, takes his tie off, off his tie, puts it back in his pocket, gives him a frask, and then he gave him a big hug. And he walked back. This person is a survivor. He says, I want you to know, when the rabbi gave me a little frask, he washed my soul clean like before I was born. Washed off all the dirt. And when he gave me a hug, he gave me strength to be a Jew till the end of days. So was your rabbi. Straight from, from heaven. Thank you. So what I want to tell you is that um, this is a good time to remember. I don't know if some of you know, why, why do we wear pears? Why are we supposed to have long hair here? Where did Esau and Yaakov, where did they split? You know, the, the head goes to here, and here begins the heart. I don't want to say anything bad. Have you ever seen Nazis? The first thing is they cut off the hair from here, right? And today those sometimes a little bit disgusting people with their haircuts. You know, the world is getting cruel again, hopefully not too much. They cut their hair, how much was the razor from here, right? That means they don't want their head and their heart to go together. They cut off the hair, the head from the heart. And what did Yaakov Avinu do? Mama she had long pants to connect the heart and the head. So Ram Nachman says the most important thing is if you want to keep the simcha for a long time, you have to talk the way simcha. Mama she was like, well, Bokshem, you know, thank you, God, everything is so good. And in Dovit HaMelech, basically all of Tilm is just thanking God. Because Dovit HaMelech, David Mark and Mashiach, what, what, what was David Amalek's, what was his thing? His thing was that you should never stop being full of joy. Whatever happens to you. You know, the Gmore said that David Amalek never, never stopped singing and never stopped playing on his, on his harp. 
Never. Remember when he was running away from Avshalom, his, his own son wanted to kill him? Can you imagine how broken he was? But it says, Mizma the Dovid, Bevochem ibn Avshalom and I. He kept on singing. Dovid Hamela. How did he keep on singing? Because the words he uttered were so beautiful. You know? Like in sometimes the heart brings about the words of joy, and sometimes then the words affect the heart. He says, because you see, this is from Gamnachman's deepest toilet. You always think you have to talk to somebody else. The most important thing, you have to talk to yourself. Dad, you want to tell them the Torah of Rav Nachman? Talking to yourself? No, don't you remember? No, talking to your foot, to your head, to your kishka. Remember? Yeah. So if I argue with him, we'll never get anywhere. So what do I do? I keep on saying, oh, it's so beautiful here. Go out, it's beautiful. Go out, it's so good. Go out, go out, go out. And see what Rav Nachman says? Good words, when I listen to my own words, it affects my heart so deep, right? And you know, sometimes I'm only sad because I talk sad words. You see what it is? It's I don't even have words to say it, but basically we didn't have so much time about meditation. You know, Barab Nachman, meditation is two things. Talking to God, talking to yourself. Mamish talking to yourself. And um, okay, maybe today you'll call it hypnosis. You know, you can hypnotize yourself as words. But Imagine I would wake up in the morning and tell myself a thousand times, please don't say bad things today. Please don't say bad <coughs> things to myself, right? You know, we have trouble listening to somebody else, but we don't have so much trouble listening to ourselves. So when I listen to myself, you know what the Gemara says, what is the most important part of the prayers? that you should hear what you're praying. God has no trouble listening. The question is always, are you listening to your prayers, you know? Say Shmai Yitzchah, Shema Kenesh, Shema Echad, give out stock market is going down, Bo Shem was all in the word. Right? If I would listen to myself, it would be give out, right? And here's one more thing Rabbi Nachman said. You know, simcha doesn't mean just, I have fun, I'm happy, it's beautiful. This stupidity. You know, joy has a certain light. You know, when you, when, a, when you look at a person and they say, I'm the simcha, well, there's no light, no, no light coming out, so they're lying, right? Simcha? Let me tell you something. I'm in a room and one person turns on the light. Then a second person walks in and he says, oh, it's dark. So I say, no, I just turned on the light. He says, yeah, you turned it on. I didn't turn it on. How does it sound? But now there was light in the room, right? Who cares who turned it on, right? See, if I am the Simcha and the light of Simcha is shining, whoever comes to my vicinity is automatically the Simcha. And this is so special, you know, like 
If I have fun and you are next to me and you don't have fun, you're sad. But if I'm really besimcha, and just remember what Rav says, besimcha means that my entire heart, my whole heart, is filled with simcha. <coughs> then the light of simcha is kevat. So Rav Nama brings a posik, simcha ish mane befiv. That means if I'm mamish besimcha, Man and believe, then I have an answer for everything. You know, that means, doesn't mean I have an intellectual answer for everything. But if I'm Mamash Besimcha, then all those words of sadness that people put on you don't enter my heart. Do you remember one of the stories I think I told you? that in Auschwitz was one Yid, his name was Reb Naftali. He was shining with Simcha the whole time. He was shining. What do you believe? He says, why am I here? I'm here because I'm a Jew. I'm here because I believe in God. Give out was blowing his mind. He never complained once. Remember the story about Hanukkah, remember that night? I don't want to get off on Hanukkah now. But do you know that the Heilige Bez Rebbe was in the, uh, in, in, the, in the ghetto in Bochnien, then he was in the concentration camp, came out in Nebuch, I think he has 13 or 14 children. All of them were killed. And he never said one word about anything which has to do with the war. Never said one word. The only thing is, his youngest child was Marshaller. And he was in a bunker. And somehow Marshaller was and suddenly they were shooting up there. And Moshe was a little boy and he thought, Nebuch, he thought that they shot his father. Nebuch, he ran out from the bunker and he started yelling in tate, tate. And they saw him and they shot him. Moshe, they didn't know how to tell the Rebbe, his last child. So when they told the Rebbe, listen what he says. He says, what a privilege, what a privilege to be part of this holy sacrifice. Now oh, he said, in Yiddish he has had to say, he says, what a privilege that I also gave a little part. He never spoke again about it. When people were talking to him about the war, anything, didn't say anything. Because words, words can knock you off. Won't you do something awesome? You know, Vishnitz, there are few rappers, how much the whole energy is into being with Simcha. You have to be filled with joy. Because the moment you're not filled with joy, you're dead. Nobody has the right to commit suicide. So I think I shared it with you. It was um, 64. And at that time, I'm always on my way to Israel. I would, in the summer, stop in Switzerland for a few days. I'm arriving in Zurich on Friday morning and uh, going to the train. You know, there's a special bus going straight from the airport to the train. And I want to go somewhere. I decided I'm going to be in hiding for one week where nobody is. And before me is a Yidale. The beard and everything. I say to him, where are you going? 
He says, I'm going to St. Moritz. He says, what are you going to St. Moritz for? He says, the Heilige Vision is this in St. Moritz. Hey, you out. The Heilige Primel, Shabbos Chazon, was like this Shabbos. Okay, I'm going to St. Moritz. I was so gewaltig. But anyway, Shabbos was awesome. And I really wanted to see the vision of the Rebbe was always besimcha. What's he doing on, on Tisha B'Av? Right. Okay, Echo was said by Yid, a survivor, when he was so broken, every word he cried for half hour. And the Rebbe was saying, nee, 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 you know, make it faster. Nee, nee. Then finally, after the first chapter, he says, please forgive me, I, I, I can't take it. Can't take it. <coughs> so the rabbi put on somebody who Mamish knocked it off fast. And after 20 minutes, we're finished with Seiko. Listen to this. And you know, when I snagged him, I don't want to say anything bad. After Echo, you sit there and you cry some more. And the vision, you know, he's like, he, out. he always stands there on his, where he is, and the seat of sand and the half moon around him. You know, the old vision, when he davened, only wish one Esra, he turned his face to the owner Kodesh. The whole davening, he was standing, and he never rolled his eyes, his open eyes to the Chabra. You know, he was standing like, like a conductor. And everybody is dominating with him every word. I mean, the dominating is so beautiful, you know. I mean, just heavenly. So the rabbi standing there, and he says, is anybody here who maybe was one tissue of my holy father, the Henrik Abishol? So, in Alta Yid, you know, never for not so many people survived, never. You know, he that comes in and says, Yeah, I was one tissue above by your holy father. So, so he says, Tell us what happened. So he says the same thing like by the Rebbe Zoleim. He says, Echo fast. Get it over with fast. You have to cry and do it fast. And then he says, The Heilige Rebbe had a melody for every passage in Echo every passage and it and it was up all night saying echo again what was his name it's you know this when i got the idea we got to make some nigunim for echo you know i met them shivri kamayim and i didn't bless me i should be privileged to do some more you know You see, Mamish, you know, Tish above, you know. Basically, the matter says one thing. A person comes with a knife and cuts me open, God forbid. And I'm crying my eyes out. Why don't you open your eyes? It's the greatest doctor in the world. He doesn't cut you open to kill you. He cuts you open to cure you. You know, in a certain way, Tisha B'Av is the highest God revelation there is. Because unless it's clear to me that it is God, you really can't take it. Can't take it. I'm not sure realize I have to tell you one more thing, which is awesome. According to Kabbalistic beliefs, anybody who, who has pain for God doesn't really feel the pain. Doesn't feel the pain. So you know, if someone, someone comes up to and whips somebody because he's a Jew, it hurts, but, okay, now listen to this. 
This is unbelievable. The Heilige Kapitschnitzer. Remember, I mentioned it to you a lot of times. In Vienna, <coughs> when they took over, the first on their list were all the rabbis. And since the biggest rabbis were grandchildren of the Holy Vision, you know, they did a lot of research before they began. They knew the address exactly of every rabbi. So, give out. So what they did, they were heartbreaking. Every morning, 6 o'clock, they would arrest all the rabbis, and then mamish, give out, give out. Heartbreaking. With whips, would make them run down the most, the big streets in Vienna. Never, you know. And then they would give them toothbrushes, this heavy acid, which burns you down, and they would tell them to clean the streets with toothbrushes. They did this for a few weeks. And you know, after two, three days, you have no more flesh on your fingers, just bones. You fell out, right? And anyway, remember I mentioned it to you, I told you, that the Heilige Sadiger made it to Israel, miraculously. And uh, he would wake up every morning, 2 o'clock, take a broom, and clean the streets of Tel Aviv. And then, one way or the other, one Chosid saw it and he stopped doing it. There's no reason he do everything secretly. So he asked, they asked the Rebbe, why are you doing it? He says, when I was cleaning the streets of Vienna with the toothbrush and it hurt so much, I made a vow that if God lets me have the privilege of coming to the Holy Land, I'll wake up every morning and I clean the streets of Tel Aviv. Awesome. But I heard unbelievable stories, you know, while he was cleaning the streets, the Chassidim didn't know about it. Who wakes up 3 o'clock in the morning in Tel Aviv and goes to work? All the push letters, right? The water carriers, the um, garbage people, right? The poor people. And when they saw the Rebbe cleaning the streets, and the way the Rebbe said good morning to them, this is a gewalt, right? See, after the Rebbe stopped doing it, the Chassidim wanted to find out what happened when the Rebbe was cleaning all the streets for so many years. You know, the Tzemach Tzedek has a whole sefer on, on, on The first thing Rav Nachman says, have you ever noticed, you know, you come to a doctor, and he says to me, my foot hurts you, hurts me. But the doctor knows really the human body. He says, you know, it's not your foot. It might be your kishka, right? But it's, the pain comes out in the foot, but it's really somewhere else, right? Imagine I'm full of pain. So Nachman says, if you're sad, it's, it's your heart who is sick, not your foot, not your head. So you see what it is, mamish? On Tisha B'Av is Mamre's a fixing of sadness. Because do you think, do you think Jeremiah stopped being full of Simcha when he composed the, the Book of Lamentation? 
Because the Gemara says that God's presence, the Shekhinah, is only when you're full of joy. And you have to taste something awesome, which is really like, not to be believed. God said that when you're sad, you cannot hear God's voice. Avraham Avinu is standing with a knife over Yitzchak, and he hears God's voice telling him, don't kill him. Take him off. You know what the Rebbe said? Imagine if Avraham Avinu would have been sad at that moment. He wouldn't have heard God's voice. I mean, this is mind-blowing. That means he was standing there and was ready to kill his son, but he didn't stop being besimcha. He did not stop being besimcha. And I have to tell you something awesome. Everybody is asking, why is it, we always talk about Avraham Avinu had a test to sacrifice his son. Why did we ever talk about what the testament was for Yitzchak. Yitzchak is 37 years old. And his father says, I heard a voice from heaven that I should slaughter you. He says, okay, I'm going. Not to be believed, right? First of all, all the rabbis say the same thing. Imagine if one time in his life, Avraham would have lied to Yitzchak. One time in his life, he would have told him something which isn't true. He wouldn't have believed him anymore, right? But anyway, this is what the rabbis say. This is awesome. Do you know when Yitzhak was lying on the altar? He went through all the pain, all the suffering, which all the Jews will go through till Mashiach is coming. But this is not all. Yitzchak went through the pain which the Yidin are feeling. But you know what Avram went through? Avram felt the pain God is going through that he has to put it on us. There's so much more. Can you imagine if parents have to inflict pain on the children? It's unbearable. So you see what it is? The test was at Avram. That Mamish, you went everything through what's going on in heaven. He was still the same. He was still filled with joy. You know what that means? That means Avram and Vino Mamish saw prophetically. He saw Mamish, everything will be good at the end. Mamish saw everything. <laughs> Good night.
telling you, so they ask your patients to have it, is it really true? You suffer because you're a Jew, you don't feel the pain, so he just closed his eyes, and he was silent for an hour, you know, he didn't say a word. I have to tell you something. You know, in Auschwitz and Purim, they wanted to give Schlagmonos, you have to give gifts to each other. And you have to give some food to each other. And two kinds of food. So where do you get in Auschwitz two kinds of food? And you know what it is? You need a certain amount of oil or fat in your body to exist. If you're completely dried out, you can't exist. <coughs> So one way or the other, the Germans give a real like stale bread and once a week you would get a little piece of butter, margarine, just a little. So a few weeks before Purim, never Kabbal, the Yidin began saving little pieces of bread, and just a little bit of butter. So they should have and Purim, not to be believed, right? Two kinds of food to give out to each other. I mean, this is beyond that, right? And there was so much besimcha that, that even in Auschwitz they can give each other like women. This is what happened. I have to say something bad about Switzerland. The Red Cross of Switzerland always loved the Jews very much. So they sent sandwiches for the Jews in Auschwitz. What kind of sandwich? Ham and cheese. Ham and cheese sandwiches. Now listen to this. It arrived on Purim. Now listen to this. You can only give Schlagmonis of a food which that person is permitted to eat. And you know, according to Alokha, when you're in Auschwitz, you're 100% permitted to eat ham and cheese to keep yourself alive. As much as they themselves didn't eat it, but they were Yoyte Schlagmonis, right? So they gave each other the sandwiches, which was bread and, 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 and meat, right? So, you know, it's so crazy, you know, like, so you think, oh, the Red Cross in Switzerland, we will begin to semite. But when you look at it from a higher place, God put in their heart to send ham and cheese, right? Unbelievable. Okay, now let's learn <coughs> Bates from Rab Nachman himself. And let me just This is an awesome Torah. You know why people are not the Simcha? Because really, let's face it, they have never done in their life one thing which gave them joy. Not one thing. So Rabbi Nachman says, what do you do? You should do one mitzvah with so much joy that you think to yourself, even if I never ever do anything else, it's worth it to live 100 years, just for this alone. You know, Rabbi Nachman says, and what Shemtu basically said, when you do somebody else a favor, the joy should be so about, you know? I do somebody else a favor, 
It should be clear to you, it's worth it to suffer a hundred years in this world just for the privilege of doing somebody else a favor. But then Rav Nachman says, when you do one mitzvah, you do one good deed with so much heart, with so much heart, then you mamish reach the level of prophecy. Remember I told you before, prophecy is only the spirit of prophecy you when you're filled with joy. I'm sure you remember that the Gemara says outside Israel there is no prophecy. It's only because after the destruction of the temple we never reached the level of enough joy to have real prophecy. But we have little prophecy. So you know, this is unbelievable. Sometimes you can feel it in heaven there's something going on, right? But it's not decreed yet. And sometimes, God forbid, it's already decreed. I want you to know something also the best I have. You know, after the Germans came into Poland, they said, Rebbe, can't you do something? Can't you pray? He says, it's where the, the decree is closed. Can't do anything anymore. You know, even in heaven, you know, God, so to speak, in heaven, they're, they're, they're dealing with it. Then you can still change it. So that's something else. But it's also not true. Because everybody knows this praying, you can change everything in the world. The only thing is, the way you pray before the decree comes out and the way you pray after the decree is out, ah, you better be about two million, million times stronger, right? So he says, because God forbid when the decree is out in heaven, then you cannot even pray anymore because the gates are closed. They have to go through the back door. And the back door is that you tell stories. And the stories and the stories opening gates. You know, there's one of the deep tires You know, imagine this girl loves somebody very much, so she gives him the door to her house. And she gets very angry, she takes the, the key away. The only thing is, she never takes away the key to the back door. So you see, Rav Nachman says, the key to the back door always open or maybe it's never closed but there if you pray it's from the front okay I tell you what happened oh, it's a crazy day but how does the wind know it's close to tissue box what yeah what's on the joke I mean, it's a little bit funny just to lift our spirit. A woman came to Ramotka Chernobyl and she says, you know, my daughter is in labor for three days and it's just never go out in those days, never. What women had to go through, never go out. For Shem now, the Vashem just said before Mashir is coming, Chava will have fixed what she has to fix, and the sign will be that childbirth is not dangerous anymore. But anyway, so she comes to Ramotra Chernobyl, 
and she says, my daughter's at the end. So the mother says, let me tell you a good story. I'm sure brother, uh, what's the name, brother Singer took, took the story of Yentl from this story. But it's a different story. There, there was a, a Catholic girl, and she wanted to become a bishop. So how do you become a bishop? You get dressed up like a man, go to the seminary, then she becomes a priest in there, and the higher priest, finally she becomes a bishop. And the bishop on Eastern is a very important day, right? So, as much as it was a bishop, but in the meantime she had a little affair with another priest. <laughs> and she became pregnant. And and she had like a very wide, wide <laughs> robe. And here comes Eastern and she has to lead the services. And the whole time she's saying, please God, don't make me have this baby on stage, you know, <laughs> while I'm the bishop. Because then let's see, I'm, I'm a woman. <laughs> and then her mother uh, started yelling, and give out, she had the baby. Mother said, you understand? He wanted to tell a story that the woman should have the baby, right? So he told a crazy story. <laughs> about the girl who wanted to be a bishop and she was praying to God, Lord, let me have the baby on stage but it did come and he said, not at all. You see what it is? While he was telling this funny story, right? The mother was praying for this woman but he saw it's already, it's closed. So it went from backstage. Awesome. And the remote the mamish left word that whenever somebody is in labor, to tell the story. Unbelievable. <laughs> you see, you have to be a rabbi, right? And I'll tell you something. I tell the story like this. Can you imagine a mother when you told the story? Most probably the deepest Yehudim and, 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 and combinations of God's name what he put in. So Rav Nachman says, this is so important. Imagine I'm so sad and I can't get out of it. Can't get out of it. So I say to myself, is there one mitzvah, is there one thing I like to do? So I decide on one mitzvah, on one good deed. And Mamish do this one good deed all your heart. And you see how deep this is. Rav Nachman says, what is called with all your heart? With all your heart means that even if I never ever do anything else, I will say I was alive. I don't know why I'm thinking to myself, when was I ever privileged Okay. I don't know why I just came to my head. I, I was I was in, 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 in Brazil and it, it, it's a whole crazy story. In Brazil I had the best manager ever. With all the respect to Sam. In Buenos Aires in Argentina, Brazil I had this about manager. And when I arrived in he says to me, I want you to know my name is Moishe Legana. He says, I grew up on the streets of Buenos Aires, and I'm basically a pickpocket. He says, I won't steal from you, how to stolen it. But you know what it is? The crazy thing is, I never got a penny. He made thousands, thousands. And I'm not even worried with him because it was so good. <laughs> I never had any publicity like this. I'm arriving in Buenos Aires. I'm on front page in every newspaper. I'm every day on the radio, every day television. You know what he organized? That the first meal I eat in Buenos Aires, I'm eating with the wife of the president, who was Peron at that time, Mrs. Peron. And you know how he got it together? Because there's a factory of kosher cheese in Buenos Aires, and they sponsored it. Because what can I eat by Mrs. Peron? I can eat crackers, 
and cheese, right? So it was crazy. The whole focus was not on me and not on Mrs. Peron. We saw cheese the whole time. <laughs> but in the meantime, I was on, on television. The whole country knew that I'm there. And uh, in all the movies, the news was me coming to Buenos Aires in Bokinap. Um, uh, you know, when I think um, in, in Rio de Janeiro, and you know, Rio de Janeiro is crazy, right? And Moise is also crazy. He put, in order to get special attention, he said that a rabbi came from America, he's singing, and Shabbos, he sang. He put some black garments, and he's not permitted to use the elevator. I'm not using the elevator, not because I'm saying. He made a whole the Judy Bush stuff, and it was in all the newspapers. <laughs> that I'm crazy. That I'm so a rich, non-Jewish uh, Brazilian called up the newspaper and he said, this doesn't sound normal. What's, what's this person doing on Shabbos? So they called up. They knew I'm in a hotel. So I said, I said I'm so sorry to tell you such stupid stories. You know, please send me uh, uh, the editor and I'll tell him what I'm really doing on Shabbos. Anyway, to make it very short, I had a Gewalt article about Shabbos, about Simcha, Gewalt. And uh, this rich Brazilian said like this, if they Every Sunday for one hour is a show on television to help those sick homeless kids. Their mom is sick, you know. He says, if I come and I sing on that show, then he is giving two million dollars for for the for the poor kids. Unbelievable, right? And you know the Jewish community is a little bit stupid. So they answered back, no, I can't come because I have to give a concert. Chil Hashem, God forbid, you know, the poor people here that I'm not giving, because I have to play in, in, in the Jewish center. I said, folks, I don't care. I'm going to the television show. Get yourself a cousin to go till I come, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid. Anyway, to make it very, very short, I was on television, and there were 100 mamish sick homeless kids you know, from the street. And I wanted them to sing with me. At that time, this was my big thing was Amis Gol Chai, right? And you cannot tell them long words, but Chai they can say, right? So I said, the Brazilian was translated in Portuguese, that we all are here to give those kids life. Chai, right? And every few minutes I was singing Amis Gol Chai, and the kids would yell Chai, you know? Chai, Chai. Okay, I got a little bit famous on the street. And wherever I went, you know, all the poor people, they live on the street. Right? Then I'm giving a concert somewhere north of Brazil. And uh, in a fancy hotel. And they have a law that uh, those poor kids are not permitted to be on hotel grounds. And I'm sitting there. It was Mama Shlani Kmud, it was Mama Shkival. And I see a little boy and a girl. The boy looks 10, the girl is 12 maybe. And they were standing there, and they're afraid to come in. They're standing by the border. So I motioned them, come in, sit down. It was crazy. They don't speak English, and they don't speak Portuguese. We were communicating so much. First of all, the girl told me it's her birthday. Hey, how are you doing? Get the good, yeah? And uh, to make it very short, I want you to know that the manager of the hotel came out and he was supposed to throw them out. I said, do me a favor, I'm paying all this heavy money. Do me a favor, give me 10 minutes of your time. I want to talk to them. So the girl told us that her father ran out from her mother before she was born. 
Then he came back with her brother. And her mother works day and night. Day and night. She cleans houses. Cleans houses day and night. And, um, you know, she and her brother, they are so sweet with each other. You know something? I told them to bring in cake and sandwiches. You know the way those kids ate? They're putting the English queen to shame. How noble they ate. I have never seen, tell you, besides the big herbs, anybody eating so noble. You know, they're starving to death. I'm sure they never had this kind of cake in their life. The way they were eating, just a little bit, couldn't believe it. And then the manager the system, you know, I have to throw them out. I said, no, I won't, you know, because if they leave, I'm leaving. In a, I put in all the newspapers because I gave a big concert that night that I was thrown out because I wanted to take care of two poor kids. <laughs> you know, he began crying. He says, do you know something? Do you know I was one of those homeless kids? And it's a milk I worked my way up. I tell you something, I wanted so much to adopt those two kids. I mean, you can't even imagine, it was just, I was a prince and a princess. And, um, you know, I was begging them, please come tomorrow with your mother. And, um, they never showed up again. And, um, you know, I, listen, so many years later, and I thought to myself, if I only had the privilege of feeding those kids, it would be the greatest thing in the world, you know? Do you know how much abuse those kids have to go through in their life? And maybe they remember they once met somebody who treated them like a human being, you know? Unbelievable. Have to tell you something else. I gave a concert in Guatemala. After the concert, we invited for a party to the president of the Jewish community, naturally a multimillionaire. And as we walk into his palace, I see eight kids, maybe seven, eight, nine, ten, and they sit under a tree. You know, all those poor people, everybody has their tree where they sleep. And I said, who are those kids? He says, that's where they live. I says, that means they are your neighbors. Are you taking care of them? I should see the way you look at me. They're kids from the street. You know, <laughs> the cutest kids in the world. And someone was there, speaks Portuguese. I said to me, if they would talk to the kids for me. Those kids have no parents, they don't even know who their parents are. They grow up on the street, can't read, can't write. How should they make a living when they're older? They have to steal. They have, they have no choice, right? So I told those kids, I want you to come tomorrow morning for breakfast to my hotel. You want to know something, how noble those kids are? I don't know how they did it. But mom wish they came the next morning washed and combed. I, I don't know where they did it. Mom is shop stick. And you know what it was? I got through to the wife of the president. Because she says, you don't have to invite them for, for breakfast. I'll give them some bread. I say, no, I want them to sit with me. I want to give them the COVID. Anyway, the wife of the president came. She ate breakfast with us. She talked to the kids. Five years later, I'm back in Guatemala. President picks me up. I say, listen, brother, how are your neighbors? I says, you know something? We were so ashamed after you left. Do you know that we adopted those eight kids? And some of them are finishing high school now. And we have a really fun for them to go to college. 
unbelievable, you know? So, you know something? If I would have had only one time spoken like this, one time I also had a big schia here in Stockholm. I walked on Meishon, and I see one of the rabbis. He is an Enkel from a Mendel of Orca. I speak to him from time to time. Right? He says to me, Shlam, I want you to know I'm at the end. My daughter is getting married tonight, and nobody knows that I don't have a single penny for the wedding. I don't have a single penny. And since I'm a little bit of a rabbi, he says, I can't ask people. He says, I know that you're a big chosid of, of my heilige, Elchazede, Ramanda Lavoka. I want you to know something. I really didn't have this kind of money. What is that? Heilige Ramanda, you're sitting up there. Make me the messenger. I give him good checks, you know, for thousands of dollars. Thousands of dollars. And the craziest thing is that checks never came back. It was Mama's little messenger, you know. Abi Mendel wanted to perform a miracle there. Turkish Mendel, like me, who walks in over his head checks. I thought to myself, obviously, even if the checks doesn't go through, it's not my money. Because I know I don't have it, right? I cannot pull out a check, 5,000. In, in October, 5,000, in December, uh, and 5,000, I don't have it. But I gave it to him. Second vault, you know. So Rav Nachman says, whenever you said, is there one thing in the world you, you did or you want to do? Why don't keep, keep you alive forever? But well, then Rav Nachman says, if you do something with Simcha, then Mamashi is so full of prophecy that you know how much you have to pray for something. If the decree is out already, if the decree is not out, you just pray. If the decree is out, then you cannot pray. You have to go through the back door. Well, you know something real strong. Boshem, I know this story from Rab Nachman. I one time came to a person, I'm not a doctor, but he had cancer. He couldn't see anymore. He was not saying he had no hair. It was at the end. So I go in there and I say, I bless you to have a full Schleimer. It's over, right? So what I did, any Hasidic story I knew about, about healing, I told him. And you know, it's just, we didn't know if he can hear or not. So I put my guitar next to him, and his wife never came out. She was saying to him, Nachman, if you hear the stories, can you just tap your finger on the guitar? You know? So he tapped his finger, you know. We have one more thing. This guy is the Simcha Hazais. You know, friends, I just told you stories of myself because I'm sure everybody has stories. Mamish, it should be clear to you if ever in your life. You did something is enough to keep your life forever. Keep your life forever. Then it says, this is the Simcha Zayis, who are Yideh is falling with Koychaz of Yirgidoy Baba. This is one more very important thing. <coughs> if you want to know how happy you are, how much you are with Simcha, very important. 
if you can mamish daven with all your heart, that means you're mamish b'simcha. Because when you have said, you cannot put your whole heart into prayer. Because you know when you're sad, you give up, right? That means you don't believe in prayer anymore. Sadness is, I don't believe in prayer. And if you believe half in it, so you'll be the same, down a little bit. You know, wh- what is the whole Torah of the Baal Shem Tov? The Heilige Baal Shem Tov says, I was only privileged to reach such a high level because I doubted with all my heart. Because I doubted with all my heart. Then Rabbi Nachman says that, you know what it means with all my heart? With every ounce of energy I have, has to be managed. Praying is not an act. It's a state. Mamish. I am Mamish praying, right? I have seen it happen here now. I tell you something. The Heilige, the Vinefsche, the son of the Heilige Rishna came in Romania, came to a city, and he wanted to go down, and with him came thousands of people. So they told him that the big shoe is too cold. They don't go there in the winter because they can't heat it. It's too cold. And the little shoe is too small for other people. What should we do? He said, let's go to the big shoe. And you know, in Romania, it's really cold, right? The rabbit died in four hours. I'm sure the people died a thousand times from cold. The Heilige, Stephanie And you know, he said, in Stephanie Epps, like in reason, he don't chuckle so much. He don't chuckle at all. He said like this. If you know something, his whole vicinity was a river of water, of sweat. <coughs> a river. His talus was wet, his capote was wet, and the whole, the whole chair around him, on the floor, came out. Can you imagine with how much strength he down his right? <coughs> but it has to reach that level of davening, you have to be the simple. You have to be much the simple. I'm saying what? You're saying that it says here the three tablets of Chile have to be simple, and what it seems to be saying is that the three tablets of Chile have to daven like that. It's also true, you know, you understand right. It's like, like, Oh, you're soft, you know. The moment you begin, to, you decide, Mom is today, I have to know, I don't care. I have to tell you something awesome. <coughs> you know, today is really the time to talk about vision, because vision is Malchus for Spirit. Remember I told you two days ago the story of the Heilige Rabbi Shol uh, Sadiger, how he spoke to his brother, the Biyana. And in Rishon, you don't daven together with Sachsidim. The Rebbe is in the room, and the door is not locked, but he would have the chutzpah to walk in. The Rebbe comes out by Kriyos HaToyret, that's it. And people knew you're not permitted to walk in. And there was a guard by the door, a guard, and he, and he didn't let anybody in. One time on Israel Chak, a day of the Yom Tif, the guard wasn't there. So one year he thought, I'll go in. He heard Rabbi Shol saying, Bo Atu Hashem, blessed are you God. And he was in a coma for three months. Can you imagine? That means he said it. When the Heilige said, the guy said, 
God's name. It was so awesome that it was in the coma for three months. You know, the biggest question is the six million. Why didn't God let the Tzaddikim know? You know, before God destroyed Sodom, he told us for Abraham. Why didn't God tell the Rebbe? I want you to know something. When the fear that he about with the Rebbe, when he passed away, and I'm sure it was one of the greatest funerals in the world ever. Like, thousands, thousands, thousands. And at that time I was very much into the Bible, so I was walking right there. And the Kapitian's Rebbe was walking. I mentioned him before, but remember, but it was with a toothbrush cleaning the streets of Vienna. So the Kapishnas said, I want you to know, God did not tell the rabbis that he takes away the Nabavit forever. If you would have known, you wouldn't have let him. You wouldn't have let him. You see what it is? If any of the rabbis would have known, they wouldn't have left. But again, it's not true. Everything, I'm a living story. You know, at the end of the First World War, some, sometimes we forget, we think that the whole Geschäft began with the Second World War. But at the end of the First World, of the first world War, in Poland and Russia, when they lost the war, right? And the peasants were complaining, why did you lose the war? The Jews. Everybody knows. Because the Jews talk Yiddish. Means they speak German. And every Jew was a secret German agent. So they killed Jews left and right. In fact, in a certain part of Poland, every Friday they hung ten Jews and they said, these are the spies who made us lose the war. But here they're hating a blue One time they didn't kill 10, they hung up 25. So they came to the hating a blue told so them things are getting out of hand, they hung 25 Yidin. You have to open your heart. The blue says, close the door, lock the door. He began smoking pipe. And the whole room was full of smoke. And they couldn't see each other. And he says, you talk to me about 25 years. In the time not so distant from now. That would be a joke. The time is coming, he says, when millions of Jews will walk in blood over their nose. Get them smoking. Finish smoking is a goodbye. This is the most unbelievable thing. The people walked out, and one says to the other, what did the rabbi say? Nobody remembered what he said. Nobody remembered what he said. After the war, maybe 20 years after the war, two years meet by the holy wall. I said, you look so familiar, where are you from? Oh, he says, 
You know, the last time I saw you was with the Heilige Brugere. Then we complained about the 25 people. He says, do you remember what he said? He says, you know something? You know when I remembered it? When I was in Auschwitz. I remember the Rebbe saying that millions of Jews will go. The Rebbe Yitz is also, you know, crazy. I only began to remember remembering it when I was in Auschwitz. It's crazy. All right, what do we know, what do we know? But you know, this was like, like all the rabbis, it was before. But now what we have to do, Mamish, we have to be so much besimcha that they are even left. The Bezer Rebbe says that if there's a six million, Every Jew is the greatest monk in the world. Every living Jew is the greatest monk. And um, mm -hmm. I will Mamish God should give you strength to hold out. On one hand, God should give us strength we need to feel a little bit. Hmm. Have to tell you something awesome. Obviously, the children today all the children from Auschwitz that came back. No question about that. I have to tell you an unbelievable story. One of my friends told me. He's teaching his children to say, you should love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the Gemur says, Bechol nafshcho, afilo noitilas nafshcho, because when it says with the heart, it's with all your heart. With the soul, it doesn't mean with all your soul. But even if it takes away your soul, when you die for God, you still have to love Him. So, he has a little girl. She's three years old. They begin saying Krishna with her. And the first time they say, you know, she refused to say it. She says, I did it. It didn't come from her head. And until she was six, she couldn't bring it out. Unbelievable. Then, after six. And then the woman says, I was in the school, I went to school. And there were some kids who really, really not into religion, right? So what's this little girl, maybe 14, 15? Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever pray? I said, do you ever pray? I was expecting him to say, you know, in the secular school that I'm praying. Do you know what she says to me? Do you know I pray with all my heart? What do we know, right? You see, today the relationship between all of us, between every Jew and God, between the world and God. So hidden, so deep. What do we know?
I hate to tell you bad things, you know, the Rogat Shava, the biggest in the world, you're not, you're not supposed to learn on Tisha B'Av. You learn right through. He says, I'll go to hell. So, you, did, you think I'll stop learning because I go to hell first? I wish we would be on that level, right? So basically, from now, like at the midday, in just my night, you know, supposed to learn. Why aren't we learning? Because it's a master of the world, all the toilets is able to enter now. You know, I come to a doctor, this is all the medication he gave me, I'm so sick. You better come out with something better. So the most unbelievable thing is, I mean, you can learn. You can learn certain things about whom is the mixtures, about everything is with really learning. Okay, and again I want you to know, please don't feel bad about the fighting. I didn't expect anything else, you know. It has to expose somebody. The morning of Tisha you know. I remember in the house of the prayer. We had also like learning the whole week. And the whole time was good. The morning of Tisha B'Av, it was mummish violence. And, and, and two mummish good kids, I don't know what to them. They jumped on each other, and one of them wanted to call the police, and somebody else mingled in. They stopped it, it was quiet. So let's just hope there's a few. 36 or 48 more hours to go to fast. If someone insults you, it's not that person insulting you today. Cool it. Because And just remember the Heilige, Heilige Ishbeth is there, test. The letter test. We are going to just prove uh, the goodness to the rest. Everything good is hidden in it. Number nine is the biggest number. Not hidden. And here is the best figure of the time. Have you ever seen I'm calling up the police and they say, listen, I have your diamonds for two billion dollars. You know, 47th Street, the diamond district. I have to walk from one side of the street to the other. I need police protection. So they give me police protection. And some other people here, just when I carry something from this, from the other side, I have police protection. Because of it, says, listen, I have a heavy garbage bag here. I need police protection. When they come. You can go, they're very safe. Nobody's going to steal a garbage bag. But now imagine, imagine, imagine if I'm a diamond dealer and I know from other professional experience that the police is not that good, right? Do you know what's happening? Listen to me. I put the, all the diamonds into a garbage bag. Right? I walk on the street with my garbage bag. I give out. Nobody wants to see it. I say, Hell, if you would only know what I'm carrying, give out. You would follow me. He says, You know what the letter test is? The letter test is diamonds in the garbage. You know what it is? Beneath the destruction of the temple, beneath Auschwitz, beneath everything. And it better be deep, right? It's the deepest certainty. And we should be privileged. We should be privileged to see it and to see it. Time time. Ask me anything. I mean, I know the answer to this.
After the war, when it came over, the war was over with the Taylor. Do you know what Taylor's do? They have a big shop, five, six Taylor's, ten Taylor's. What are they talking on Taylor? Shoot the Taylor. So this is the question I have. That I, 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 I was so bored with the first again in the country. We were about 20 people working there. Because you know, every half hour, one of the 20 would be the moral hour. Which means while they were working, everybody was laughing. I mean, that was learning. Because you know, I worked there for a few hours, and I went to the whole time. I went to the whole time. Just for a scene, um, the head of you to learn and learn and to spend time. I'm <laughs> 